I'm going to try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right, it sounds like you're awake, and it's so good to see you in God's house this morning. And we're honored that you could be here on this Sunday leading into Independence Day. And so we have a little bit of uh, patriotic music for you this morning. But we're going to start together with you helping us. If you would, please stand and open your songbook to song number 131. Song number 131, the national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, we're going to sing both, both verses. Oh, say, can you see? Oh, say. Thank <laughs> you. 
thank so much. Uh, they put a lot of effort into all that. And uh, 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 just appreciate so much all the time that they put in. Uh, Mr. Arliss, uh, he hand wrote the instrument parts for that entire song, 20 some pages. <laughs> appreciate so much him doing that, and I appreciate so much the kids participating. And uh, uh, who knows, next time we might even have any more. Uh, more kids. But we're going to let them be dismissed as you turn in your songbooks, please. The song number 126. As we stand together, song number 126. My country, tis of thee. Help us out 
that would be great. If you would bring some drinks, whatever you like to drink, as in soft drinks. <laughs> uh, soft drink, sweet tea, uh, uh, pop That's what we call it in Colorado, we just call it pop uh, But if you want to bring some, uh, some drinks, some chips, cookies, anything like that uh, We'll be supplying the hot dogs And we'll have a, a great time if you want to bring your dominoes or a board game or whatever And we'll have some activities to do until it gets dark And then we'll have fireworks So invite folks to come out for that if you would please You'll notice that next Sunday morning in your bulletin, we're going to be having the Phillips family in concert. And these are some uh, friends of the Irwins. Uh, Brother Tony has heard them before in person. And so we're going to be hosting them next Sunday morning, the Phillips family singers. And so uh, invite some folks to come out with, uh, uh, with you for that. As our ushers come tonight, uh, this morning, you'll see that there are a lot of things coming up. In your, uh, in your bulletin uh, coming up on the calendar. And so uh, please make those things a part of your schedule. Uh, well, if they apply to you. We don't want any men signing up for the ladies' conference, you know. But uh, feel free to look there in the bulletin and uh, just uh, jump in and get a part. We're making plans right now, of course, for Vacation Bible School, which the theme for Vacation Bible School is basically apologetics. Discover, decide, and defend. In fact, it uses the same key verse for Vacation Bible School that we're using during our apologetic series on being able to give an answer. And so uh, uh, please keep that on your schedule, on your calendar. All right, anything that I've missed this morning? All right, Brother David Tooley, would you ask the blessing on our offering this morning, please? Father, thank you so much for this gathering of great Christians and, and whatever walk in life and where they're at in their Christian life. Thank you for giving us a house together and worship you, Lord. Please give us the strength to carry your word and, and your wishes as we can move forward in our short life on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. that all men are created equal. 
Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place to those who here gave their lives that this nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead have consecrated it far beyond our poor power to add or detract. The world will little know nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living brother, to be here dedicated to that unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the unfinished task remaining before us. That from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave their last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that this uh, government of the people by the people for the people shall not perish from the earth and you recognize that of course as what as the Gettysburg address and this morning I want to speak to you on a, a subject a sermon that I've entitled The Gospel in the Gettysburg Address. And you may have recognized, if you've been in church for any length of time, that a lot of words and phrases in the Gettysburg Address sound like your Bible. Abraham Lincoln biographers have noted that he read his Bible so much that you can hear God's word in his speeches. And so you and I that are familiar with our Bibles, we've, we were able to pick out some of those words and some of those phrases from his address. And so I want to take out some of those words and phrases that we find in the Bible or that we find very similar in our Bibles and bring a message this morning. The first phrase that you find uh, well, not the first one, but the first one that we're going to look at this morning is he said that these dead shall not have died in vain. Shall not have died in vain. If you would look in your Bibles, please, at Galatians 2.21, or you can look on your version app, whatever the case may be, on your phone. Um, a lot of times, I just like to look it up in a book. But in Galatians 2 and verse 21, Paul here tells the uh, churches at Galatia, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If you can be righteous in what you do? If you can be righteous any other way, then it was completely unnecessary. It was vanity. It was wasteful for Jesus Christ to die on the cross. Completely unnecessary. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 14. The Bible says, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Skip to verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. 
So the question that I first want to answer this morning is, why did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus have to die? Now, by way of introduction, let me say this. If you could imagine, this is going to be really hard. I want you to imagine for a minute that you are God. You are God who did not have a beginning, who has been eternally existent, and you stand alone as God asks in Isaiah, is there anybody else out there that wants to come stand up here with me? Because there's nobody that can do it. So imagine for, for a moment that you are God. You are all-powerful creator. You spoke this entire universe into existence, and you created man from the dust of the ground so that you could have someone created in your image that you could fellowship with. Are you with me so far? And you wanted that man to love you because he wanted to love you. Right? So you gave him free will. He can choose to love you or not choose to love you. You don't want somebody to love you because they have to. Right? What kind of love is that? So you created mankind with free will and a choice to love you. What did mankind do? They sinned. And as soon as they sinned in the Garden of Eden, they died. Now how did they die? They didn't die physically. They died spiritually. And God comes, as it were, to walk and talk with Adam and Eve, and He shows up, and they're not there. Remember? Adam, where art thou? Where are you? And He's like, I'm naked. And I was hiding. And God said, who told you you were naked? Right? Now they have sinned. So God says, I cannot have a relationship with this person now. So, there needs to be a plan. So that mankind can have a relationship with me. <coughs> so, here is my plan. Since they cannot pay the penalty themselves, they're sinful. They can't pay the penalty. Mankind cannot do it. Someone who is holy and perfect and just will have to make the payment. So God the Son, in the form of Jesus Christ, comes to this, this earth, takes on a robe of flesh, and dies on the cross as the perfect, sinless sacrifice so that you and I might be redeemed. You ever take a coupon to the store and redeem it? Okay? He purchased us. He purchased us with that perfect sinless sacrifice. And God, you, your God, remember? Your son died for all of mankind. And you said, all right, if you will accept the payment of my son, then you can have fellowship with me. You and I can fellowship together. Not only that, you will live eternally. Where? In my heaven. Are you with me so far? And then what happens is we say, well, there's a lot of ways to get to your heaven. Excuse me? <laughs> I created this whole thing. It was all my idea. Remember me? God. I have all the ideas. And my son died for you. And you think there's another way? No, there's not another way. I'm the guy that made the plan. Okay? It's open to all of you. The free gift is available to all of you. If you'll just put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, my son, that he died on the cross for you and you'll accept that payment and my righteousness will be applied to you then you can have an eternal relationship with me 
Remember what Jesus said? Anybody that tries to come in a different way is a what? You know it. Talk to me. A thief and a robber. Right? That's the guy who tries to come in the window. Right? But God says, I'm the one that created all this. I'm the one that put all this in motion. I have the plan. I have the solution. And you think you have a different way. Like Brother Tony says, you may think you have your own way. What you don't have is your own universe to have your own way. This is God's universe. He has the way. Why did Jesus Christ have to die? First of all, because of his nature. Because of his nature. And we just touched on these two things. Namely, God is perfectly holy. The Bible says, it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Isaiah 57, 15 says, for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. See, God doesn't decide to do holy things. God is holy. That's what he is. He can't be anything different. God is holy. Secondly, God is just. God is just. Genesis 18 verse 25 says, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So God is holy. God is perfect. God is just. And because God is just, sin has to be paid for. The wages of sin is death. That's what you get paid for sinning. Your wage is death. The wages of sin is death. Why? Because God is perfectly holy, but God is also perfectly just. He is the only just one, the only just judge that is keeping the record. And the Bible says that there will come a day when all the graves will be opened and some will rise to judgment and some will rise to eternal damnation. God is the final judge. God will make the final decision. God is perfectly just. And so because this sin has separated us from God... Because his justice demands a payment. Now, not only do we have the nature of God being perfect and just, we have the nature of man. The nature of man, as we just mentioned, is that we are all sinners. We are all sinners. I probably don't even need to convince you of that. Right? Just read the newspaper. We are all sinners. Mankind is a sinner. And so the first human couple made a willful choice to disobey God. They only had one rule. One rule. And they couldn't keep the one rule. And so this sin resulted in their separation from a perfect, just, and holy God. And so the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5 that whereas, for, whereas by Adam, one, uh, as by one, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. So as by one man, sin passed upon everyone. Every one of us were conceived in sin. <clears throat> So God could not have a relationship with humankind the way they were because of sin. That would violate his holiness. That would violate his justice. He couldn't overlook it. He couldn't just wink at it and say, okay, it's all good. It'll be all right. But there is another aspect of the nature of God, and that is... Not only is God holy, and not only is God just, but God is love. God is love. And so he had the answer. He had the solution. So he couldn't just stand by and do nothing. And so he provided a way 
For all of mankind who are spiritually dead in their sin to have spiritual life. And the only way that God's justice and holiness could be satisfied was a payment by someone who was holy and righteous on our behalf. And so Jesus Christ came to this earth, lived 33 and a half years as the God-man, and died a cruel death on the cross so that our sin debt could be paid, and the righteousness of God could be applied to our lives. It wasn't my idea. I would have never thought of that. It wasn't my plan. It's not my universe. It's not my creation. It's all of God. And so the Bible continues in Romans chapter 5, that is where, uh, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. That was Adam. By the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. The one being Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now you and I can willfully choose or not choose to have God's righteousness applied to our lives. So, did Christ die in vain? Well, I don't know. Do you think that there's another way? Do you think you can be good enough? If you can be good enough to get into heaven, if you can be good enough to have a relationship with God, He didn't need to die on the cross. How about if you can keep the law? What if you could keep all 613 laws in the Old Testament? Do you think you could be good enough to keep all those? If, if you could be good enough to keep all 613 laws, Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. There was no point. The answer would be, keep the law. And when you die, if you're good, I'll let you in. But God knew that we couldn't do that. So you can't be good enough. You can't keep the law good enough. You can't say enough Hail Marys or whatever it is. God had a plan. God devised a plan. It was all his plan. It was all his idea from the beginning. And he gives us a way. All we have to do is accept that way. Because you and I are spiritually dead. So did Christ die in vain? I don't know. I mean, he may have died in vain for you as an individual if you're trying to do it some other way. But Christ died that God's righteousness might be applied to you and I. That's why Jesus died on the cross. The second phrase that I borrowed from the Gettysburg Address is a new birth of freedom. A new birth of of freedom. That doesn't sound entirely foreign to us, does it? A new birth of freedom. Look in your Bibles in John chapter 3. Because this salvation that we're talking about is also phrased in your New Testament as being born again. Now that sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? It sounded weird to Nicodemus. You remember who Nicodemus was? Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a ruler. You remember the Pharisees were the religious guys. They no doubt had the Old Testament completely memorized. All 39 books of the Law and the Prophets memorized. And yet Jesus Christ, the Son of God, comes on the scene and says, You must be born again. And Nicodemus is scratching his head saying, What? And so you notice that Nicodemus, Nicodemus in John chapter 3 comes to Jesus at night. Right? I mean, I'm a big leader in the Pharisees. I got my fancy duds. I've got all the Old Testament up here. Uh, but this Jesus, I'm not so sure. I'm going to go see him at night. So he comes at night and he says, Now we know that you're a teacher come from God. <laughs> For nobody can do all these miracles that you're, that you're doing except they're from God. So we know, but I'm just not getting the, the whole picture. Right? And so, uh, 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 Jesus says to him, 
In verse 3, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Now we tend to think that he's talking about going to heaven. And that's included. But we're talking about a spiritual kingdom that you only see with spiritual eyes. You only have a perception of the Christian life and a Christian perspective of life when you see the spiritual kingdom for what it is. And you can't come into that kingdom on your own. You must be born again. And Nicodemus, of course, I think, was a little confused by that. And he said to verse 4, How can a man be born when he was old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus has got to be thinking, Really? You're serious? No. Verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, capital S, Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. But I want, we're talking about being born again this morning, so look at verse 7. So he says, marvel not, don't be amazed that I said to you, ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. Why? Because we already said that you and I can't do it on our own. If you and I could do it on our own, Jesus didn't have to die on the cross. I don't know how to make it any simpler than that. If there was any other way for you to experience the Christian life, the kingdom of God, as God designed it to be, if there was any way, other way for you to do it, he didn't have to die on the cross. So Jesus died on the cross so that you and I could be born again. Now what does it mean to be born again? That phrase, born again, in your Bible means to be regenerated or re -gened. Regenerated or re -gened. I want to give you an example this morning. So I'm going to ask uh, Brother Meyer to come in and um, Destiny to come in and... Uh, Where'd Dylan go? I mean Dustin. Where'd Dustin go? Dustin, come on up. Stand, stand right over there. Perfect. All right? Come on in and stand right here in the middle. And look beautiful. And where's Brother Meyer? Where's Brother, here he is. Actually, you move over here, Destiny. And, and Brother Meyer is going to stand in the middle. Right up here in the middle, Brother Meyer. Everybody, one, two, three. Uh, good, we got that over with. Okay. Uh, it's just a dog. Okay, now, uh, let me explain this to you. Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be re regenerated. Now, look at this plant right here that Miss Cherry brought in. Isn't that a beautiful, whatever that is? What is that? It's a plant. Anybody know what that is? Okay, it's one of those. Alright, so we have, we have this beautiful plant. This plant belongs to the animal kingdom. Are you with me so far? I'm not going too fast, am I? Okay, this plant belongs to the animal kingdom. This plant can never become part of, uh, what did I say this was? Uh, but it's part of what? No, that was the plant kingdom. This plant can never become part of the animal kingdom. Right? Now, we could put a collar on this plant. It is not going to be a dog. We could feed it dog food. Instead of miracle growth. And it's not going to be a dog. Why? This plant is a part of the plant kingdom. It doesn't matter what you do to it. It can't become part of the animal kingdom. 
We could put a lead on it and take it for a drag. It's not going to become part of the animal kingdom. Now, here we have Brother Myers' cute little puppy dog. You agree with that? And he loves that, he loves that little dog. And if, if you don't think so, you should have been here the day that he accidentally backed over the other one. So he loves this little dog. Now, Brother Meyer has this little dog, but I'll tell you what, this dog is a part of the animal kingdom. And no matter what you do to that little dog, it will never be a human. I'm sorry, it's the best example I can find in the human race. No matter what you do to this dog, it will never be a human. You can put clothes on your dog, as some people have been known to do. It will not become a human. You can let your dog ride in the car with you. You can even put a seatbelt on your dog, as I've seen advertised. Your dog is not going to become human. You can let your dog sleep in your bed. You can feed it food off of your table. That dog will never become a human. That dog is gened to be a dog. It is in the animal kingdom. It will forever be in the animal kingdom. It doesn't matter what you do. You know what? We could baptize that dog and it's still going to be a dog. We could give that dog communion and it's still going to be a dog. We can, teach, we can teach that dog to put its paws together and give it a form of, of, of that it's prey. It's still a dog. It's gene to be a dog. It's part of the animal kingdom. It will always be a part of the animal kingdom. That will never change. doesn't matter what you do. You can bring it to church four times a week. It will never become a human. It is gene to be a dog. Now we have a human over here. We have a human over here that wants to become part of the kingdom of God. And you can do all kinds of things to this human. You can dress him up in fancy clothes. It's not going to make him a part of the kingdom of God. You can baptize him. It's not going to make him a part of the kingdom of God. You can give him communion. He can drink grape juice for every meal. He's not going to become a part of the kingdom of God. He can come to church every day. He can read his Bible every day. He can pray every day. He can run around the church three times. He can raise his hand during the songs. He can pray fervently. It's not going to regene him to be in the kingdom of God. God, he has to be re -gene. He has to be born again. And mankind is the only kind that has the opportunity to be re -gene. We can be born again spiritually and be made spiritually alive and become part of the kingdom of God. A plant can't become an animal. An animal can't become a human. And you, in your own power, cannot become part of the kingdom of God. You have to be born again. You have to be regenerated. re -gene. Only through the perfect, sinless sacrifice of Jesus Christ is that possible. For you to be re gene And you can, try, you can try to turn over a new leaf. That's not going to put you in the kingdom of God. You can be a moral person. And that doesn't put you in the kingdom of God. You can be honest, loyal, up, upright, trusty, whatever the Boy Scouts are. It will not put you into the kingdom of God. God, you have to be re -gene. You must be born again to enter that kingdom. And that was only made possible by the death of God the Son on the cross.
Thank you, guys. You can be seated. So you must be regenerated to enter into the kingdom of God. You must be regenerated to enter into a higher kingdom. So that leads me to the third and final point that I borrowed from the Gettysburg Address. And he said, shall not perish. Shall not perish. And we could all probably quote John 3 verse 16. Because if you read John chapter 3 and Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus, then eventually we come to verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And if you have been regenerated and regenerated, born again, and you are now in the kingdom of God, you have everlasting life right now. Right now. I can remember about six years ago when my mother-in-law died, and we were, I was in the hospital with her, and her husband was sitting there and had his Bible open and was talking to her and said, you are not going to cease to live. You're going to close your eyes and you are going to make this seamless transfer from here to being in the presence of God. And that's how it works. Because if you have been regenerated, you, you and I have eternal life right now. Now, this old flesh will die. Right? This corruption will be put off. But that soul lives on forever and shall not perish. So, will you and I physically die? Yes. The death rate is one per person. Right? One or four out of four people die. Right? We're all going to die. Like Brother Tony says, one of you in this room is going to be next. One of us in this room is going to be last and everybody else will be in between. We're all going to die, but we act so shocked when it happens to somebody. We're all going to die and then judgment. So do you have eternal life now? How do you get it? There's only one way. I'm sorry. There's only one way. You know, it's like um, there's many paths to heaven. It's like going to Dallas. Well, that would be fine as, you know, if when you died, you went to Dallas. But there's only one way. Some of you think you do, don't you? <laughs> Yeehaw! <laughs> when I die, I'm staying right in Texas. So, but there's only, there's only one way. God only created one way. And Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, as Miss Rachel comes, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. There is a distinction between your body and your soul. Your body will one day die. Your soul can live on forever if you have been regenerated and regenerated so that you can enter into the kingdom of God. And it sounds so simple, huh? Why did we take 35 minutes to explain it? I don't know. Because it, it really isn't any more simple than that. But why is it that we don't see it? Why is it that, that millions don't see it? Jesus Christ died. Did he die in vain? I hope he didn't die in vain in your case. Because he's the answer. Jesus, the Son of God. Perfect, sinless sacrifice for your sins and for mine. So if we'll accept that holy and just payment on our behalf and be regenerated and regenerated, then Jesus Christ will transfer us from this kingdom to the kingdom of God. Now you're going to be here. 
We live right here on planet Earth. But we will be spiritually in the kingdom of God. And then you'll see things from a completely different perspective. Do you think Dustin sees things differently than Snowball or whatever that dog's name is? You can do this, and then I can hear it rattle, and I know it. So, yes. I mean, I should hope to shout that you see things differently than a dog. And when you transfer from this state to a spiritual state in the kingdom of God, then you and I have a different perspective. And we see things differently. And then it's like, that doesn't make any sense what they're doing. How come they don't see that that doesn't work in life? Why are they trying to have a marriage like that? Why are they trying to have a work relationship like that? Can't they see that that doesn't work? No. They're in a whole different kingdom. They're in a whole different kingdom. It's like trying to get a dog to understand why he should do certain things. He doesn't see it like you and I see it. He's in a completely different kingdom. So you and I need to be regene, born again, into the kingdom of God. And then, as Brother Tony phrases it, life makes sense. Then life makes sense. And you see how God intended for things to work from his perspective. So this morning as we stand together and Miss Rachel plays, maybe you're back at point number one and you have never understood that Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus Christ died for you as an individual. So this morning, did Jesus Christ die in vain for you? As an individual, are you trying some other way? Are you trying to sneak over the wall or through a window or uh, build, dig a tunnel or something? Or you just need to come to Jesus Christ and acknowledge, yes, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, paid the perfect, sinless sacrifice for my sin, and I can accept that payment and be regenerated into His kingdom. So this morning, as we pray together, heads are bowed. If you want to come to this altar and pray, you're welcome to do that. If you want to come talk to me, you want to talk to someone else. We'll show you not what the Baptists think, but what the Bible says about being regenerated and born again into the kingdom of God as we pray.